Have you ever had any friends who are kind of like a shadow? You know, they're, they're at your side when the sun is out, but as soon as the skies are dark, they disappear. Well, these friends might return when it's comfortable, when it's convenient for them. Well, Proverbs chapter 19 describes a few scenarios like this. It says, wealth brings many new friends, but a poor man is deserted by his friend. Many seek the favor of a generous man, and everyone is a friend to a man who gives gifts. Proverbs chapter 18 says this, A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. I would guess that all of us have been hurt by fair weather companions, but a deep, genuine friendship with someone who faithfully sticks with you no matter what, that's a gift from God, isn't it? It's a treasure for life. Well, this month in our Wisdom for Life series, we're surveying the scene to see what Proverbs has to say and what all of God's Word has to say about relationships. So, so far we've seen that we glorify God when we seek a right relationship with Him and with others. And then last week we saw it's wise to avoid a deep friendship with someone who lives foolishly. So today we'll see the other side of that coin. And that is to say that it's wise to seek out and to cultivate deep friendships with people who live wisely. What is living wisely? Well, this Wisdom for Life series is built on the foundation in Proverbs and throughout the whole Bible that, that defines living wisely as living humbly under God's ultimate authority. Living humbly under God's ultimate authority. So living wisely begins with recognizing that we did not create ourselves for our own purpose, but that God created us for His purpose. Those of you with a heart that's beating right now, you, you didn't do that. It, it's not, it's, your heart isn't beating right now because you geniusly created your own cardiovascular system or this whole planet that's wonderfully fit for human habitation. Your heart is beating right now because there is this glorious, eternal creator who revealed himself to some extent in his creation, but then ultimately through Jesus Christ and his work and his word, the Bible. So to live wisely then, with every heartbeat, is to live in light of the reality that, that we are ultimately creation under a creator's authority. Well, Proverbs says that we live in uh, a relationship with one another. As, as we grow in relationship, we start to talk and think and act like the people we spend time with. No one was born with a southern accent. Or a Uper accent, eh? Or a Boston accent. No one was born with an accent. Well, this principle is in Proverbs chapter 13. It says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Well, God's word is as practical as it is true. If you want to become wise, spend time with people who are wise. If you want to learn to live like a fool and suffer harm, it's simple. Surround yourself with fools. Well, as I was reading Proverbs this week, it occurred to me, I confess, that last week I unwittingly neglected one fool. Proverbs chapter 26 introduces us to the madman. It says, like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, well, I was only joking. So the proverbial madman is the guy who talks out of his backside and then covers it by saying, yeah, I was only joking. So whether this person is lying, or exaggerating, or, or faking something, or whatever, Proverbs says that a friendship with the madman is about as pleasant as hanging out with someone who's trying to kill you with fiery arrows. So, as we saw last week, in, in addition to avoiding deep friendships with the arrogant, the quarreler, the brawler, the schemer, the drunkard, the revenge seeker, the bribe acceptor, the wealth obsessed, the thief, the greedy, the flatterer, the stingy, the fake gift giver, the dreamer, the sluggard, the adulteress, the perverse speaker, the mocker, the scoffer, the liar, the gossip, the faker, and the wicked. Proverbs says it would also be wise to avoid a deep friendship with the madman. So, as we saw last week then, is it against the backdrop of all those fools the Proverbs urges us to cultivate, to intentionally cultivate and build deep relationships with people who live wisely 
and that is live humbly under God's sovereign authority. So we become like the people we spend time with. Wise people cultivate deep friendships with people who live wisely. Well, it's God's intention that we would sharpen and encourage one another to live wisely as we grow together. So it says Proverbs chapter 27. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. It's no secret that iron tools cannot sharpen themselves. Wise people need each other. Wise people cultivate deep relationships with people who help them to live wisely. So how can you recognize those people? Well, Jesus said that a tree is known by its fruit. So a person is known by his actions, what he says, what he does. That's how you can tell where their heart is. So God's word gives a list of characteristics that will be increasingly evident in the lives of people who live wisely. This list is often called the fruit of the Spirit. So, so when God the Holy Spirit comes in and replaces a spiritually dead heart that all of us was born with, and, and replaces that with a new heart that wants to l love and obey God, who loves us so fully, that process and that new life will bear this good fruit. Galatians chapter 5 says it like this. This is the evidence of what, what that'll look like. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So each of these things are developed and demonstrated in community. So just as tools cannot sharpen themselves, you, you cannot isolate yourself and become more loving or more peaceful or more gentle. So God fulfills his purpose for us as we live in relationship with one another. So then the Bible urges us to cultivate deep friendships with other Jesus followers who are learning to live humbly under God's authority and going through the same process. So how would you find them? Well, the wisdom for life in Proverbs helps us recognize these evidences of God's transforming grace at work in the life of every believer. Chapter 10, love. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Have you seen that? Chapter 10. Chapter 10, joy. The hope of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. Next verse. Chapter 16 says, Peace. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Looks like our, there we go, our slideshow is stuck there. So chapter 25, patience. With patience, a ruler may be persuaded and a soft tongue will break a bone. Chapter 11, kindness. A man who is kind benefits himself, but a cruel man hurts himself. Chapter 12, goodness. A good man obtains favor from the Lord, but a man of evil devices he condemns. Chapter 14, faithfulness. Do they not go astray who devise evil? Those who devise good meet steadfast love and faithfulness. Chapter 15, gentleness. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. And chapter 10, self-control. A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. See reflections of the fruit of the Spirit in the wisdom for life in Proverbs. So the life of someone who walks in wisdom by living humbly, humbly under God's ultimate authority will be marked by this fruit of the Spirit. So we know we can't just manufacture wisdom on our own. Wisdom comes from God. So what does God's Word say about how the creator, the ultimate authority of all of his creation, gives us wisdom for life. Well, our good and sovereign God often uses trial, uses trials, difficult times to, to humble us, to help us see our need for him, and then ultimately to give us his wisdom for life. So the Holy Spirit inspired words of the New Testament letter called James were written by James. He's the younger half-brother of Jesus. They shared a mother in Mary, so they're half-brothers. So the first audience of James' letter was this first generation of Jews who recognized that Jesus Christ really is God's promised Messiah. Well, then there was the Jewish leaders, the religious elite. They, they rejected this truth, and they ensured that anyone who followed Jesus would meet persecution and trials of various kinds. So the New Testament letter called James says it this way. It says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. 
For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Some people call James the Proverbs of the New Testament. So even still, the idea of counting it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds is absolute nonsense to this unbelieving, rebellious world. The wisdom of this world says, count it all joy when life is all pleasure and no pain. And everything does what you want. Everybody does what you want. Everybody listens to you. Everything's just right. And your car never breaks down. That's joy. But God calls us to a deeper joy. God's wisdom for life says that we can and we should count it all joy when we meet trials of various kinds because of his unchanging goodness and his unchanging purpose. But look at this verse here. Notice that James is addressing the gathered church on the assumption that they're facing these trials together. You meet various trials together, like brothers in arms. So James reminds them that God is at work even in the trials of various kinds that test their faith. God would use this testing of their faith to produce something in them, for something good. He would produce steadfastness in them as they endured together. It's God's purpose that they would endure together. So God is forming the character of Christ in them. That's what he's doing here. How else could he do this? Well, then the pattern we see in Scripture is that God generously gives everything that his people need. So the, the people in the first century church who were persecuted, they needed each other. And they needed this encouragement so that they could endure together by God's grace. So to put it in historical context, nearly a thousand years before this, before James wrote this letter to persecuted Christians who were enduring trials of various kinds together, God gave the wisdom of Proverbs to his people. Many of the first hearers of James' letter would have known this proverb from chapter 17. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. So living wisely in adversity involves cultivating deep friendships with people who are wise. They're living humbly under God's authority. Remember, the man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So living wisely in adversity means cultivating these friendships. So, so what would it look like to find a friend who sticks closer than a brother? Where could you find that? Someone who sticks with you as you walk through adversity, all the ups and downs of life, how could you find that person? When I was a little guy, my parents would say, be the kind of friend that you would like to have. This proverb says much to say about deep friendships between people who live wisely. We'll touch on three themes and then we'll consider what it might look like for us to develop those kind of relationships here in the church. So first, if we want to cultivate deep friendships with people who live wisely, Proverbs urges us to plan well. So we know adversity is on the way in this broken world. So chapter 15 says this. It says, Without counsel, plans fail. But with many advisors, they succeed. And chapter 20 adds this wisdom. It says, Plans are established by counsel. By wise guidance, wage war. This isn't Disneyland. War is life and death. War has a purpose. It's no secret that you and I will continue to face trials while we remain in this broken world. The spiritual war rages all around us. When I say it has a purpose, I mean both sides have a purpose. They're trying to do something. So planning well to survive and to thrive requires wise counsel or wise guidance in our lives. And it should be no secret that wise counsel comes from surrounding yourself with wise people. Some more on this in chapter 24. It says, a wise man of full of strength and a man of knowledge enhances his might. For by wise guidance you can wage your war, and in an abundance of counselors there is victory. So notice the parallels there. A man of knowledge is paralleled with a wise man, kind of same thing. And so, so what is the strength that he's full of? What is this, what is this 
might that he enhances. And how does he do that? How does he enhance his might? How does he increase his strength? Well, this is what we've been seeing all morning. Wise, plan, wise people plan well for the future by cultivating deep friendships to surround themselves with others who live wisely. A wise man's strength is in his abundance of counselors. So planning well for every, each day of the rest of your life means surrounding yourself with an abundance of wise counselors. But Proverbs 18 presents a stark contrast to this wise man with an abundance of counselors. It says this, Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. So Proverbs presents two paths for us this morning. Both require effort. It requires effort to surround yourself, and frankly, it requires effort to isolate yourself. Especially these days. So which path will you choose to travel on? It certainly is tempting, isn't it, to, to step back or to isolate ourselves entirely when there's conflict? Feels like the sun is not shining anymore on our friendship. So what kind of friend will you be? What kind of friend will you be? Be like a shadow? What kind of friendship will you seek? What kind of people will you seek? Just say that pulling back from the accountability and the fellowship of faithful Christian friends is a slow fade. It's not just flipping a switch. I isolating and break isolating yourself and breaking out against sound judgment, it doesn't happen overnight. It's an incremental process. So is surrounding yourself with wise people. So planning well by surrounding yourself with wise people sets you up to be surrounded by their wise counsel. Again, both of these take effort. Which road will you walk on? So Proverbs has much to say about listening wisely, or excuse me, listening to wise advice. Chapter 19 says this. It says, listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. Well, none of us is born with wisdom. So the, the command to listen to instruction implies that this instruction would come from a wise person. It doesn't come from ourselves. So this implies relationship. So true wisdom is only and ultimately from God. So sometimes we'll receive it directly from reading his word. Other times we receive wisdom from, from wise people who know and love and treasure God's word and teach us to do the same. God's word is full of wisdom for life. And learning to walk in that wisdom is a lifelong process. Proverbs chapter 19 says this. Cease to hear instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. Let's say, for those of us who drive, you know, to keep your hands on the steering wheel, to, to keep you off the sidewalk or out of the ditches. So similarly, we have a tendency to drift away. If you take your hands off, it'll drift eventually. So similarly, we, we have a tendency to drift away from, from right thinking, if we're not intentional, to keep the hands on the, on the relationship steering wheel. So putting in the effort to cultivate these deep friendships with people who walk humbly under God's authority is keeping our hands on the steering wheel of the Christian life. Is it worth the effort? Is it worth the effort to keep your hands on the steering wheel by surrounding yourself with wise counsel? So it takes effort, but it's no burden. It's a fruitful venture. In fact, chapter 27 describes it like this. It says, Oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. Look at the picture, the word picture. Earnest counsel from a wise friend is sweetness to the soul. Have you experienced that? Experience having a wise friend who walks deeply with God, and they love you because they love Jesus, and they know that he loves them? It's sweetness to the soul to be around people like that. But not only that, it could also be life-saving. Chapter 13 says that the teaching of the wise is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. Turning away from the snares of death implies being in them in the first place. Well, God's word says that we came into this world physically alive, but spiritually dead, 
spiritually in the snares of death, as the proverb says. And if you have been parents, know that no parent needs to teach a child to disobey. <laughs> in fact, anyone with a child knows every child is born thinking they don't need parents. It takes a work of God's grace even to get a child to receive instruction. This is evidence of his common grace. So Proverbs chapter 15 offers a word for all ages, not just children. It says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. You know that rebellious, spiritually dead heart you're born with? No one ever outgrows it. You can't grow out of it. You can't mature out of it. No one outgrows a rebellious heart. I want you to feel the heaviness of that. No one outgrows a rebellious heart. No creation outgrows rebelling against the Creator. No, no creation all of a sudden just conjures up the wisdom inside himself to, to not rebel against the Creator. Because that rebellion is evidence of spiritual death. So what is your hope? What's my hope? We have one hope. Our only hope is God's life-saving, life-transforming grace received through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only hope ever. You can't worldly wisdom your, your way into a right relationship with God. So I have to ask you, because I love you. Really, what's your hope? What's your real hope in? As evidenced by things that make you excited, as evidenced by things that make you angry. Where is your hope ultimately? Who is your hope ultimately in? Are you living wisely under God's authority? Are you living humbly as creation under the ultimate authority of the Creator? Now what about the people you spend time with? What about, what about the people you listen to? What about the people you listen to on the radio or on the news or music you listen to? Are they living wisely? Who do you listen to most? I'm struck by something Paul Tripp said years ago. No one talks to you more than you do. No one talks to you more than you do. You can listen to somebody all day long, but in your head, you're always talking to yourself. So if you're a Christian, are you filling your head with the truth and wisdom and love of God's word? Are you saturating your mind with the reality that you are loved by this great God who made you for his purpose and, and, and is glorified in creation, but even so much more in the redemption that you can have by grace through faith in Jesus Christ? Are you saturating your mind with the reality that you are loved and you are a creation under the ultimate authority of your Creator. Are you filling your head with the truth and wisdom of God's Word? Well, listening to advice from people, uh, people who are wise is certainly a mark of wisdom for life. How much more listening to correction from them? Proverbs chapter 15 speaks of the fool who avoids wise people because he doesn't want to be corrected. It says this, A scoffer does not like to be reproved, so he will not go to the wise. By way of contrast, verse 31 says this. The ear that listens to a life-giving rebuke will dwell among the wise. So we're either, every day in all our relationships, we're either growing wiser or growing more foolish. So, so what if you choose to surround yourself only with people who tell you how smart you are and how fun you are and how right you always are and your politics are just right and your theology is exactly right and you're exactly right in everything. What if you surround yourself with people who tell you how smart and fun and right you are all the time? Proverbs chapter 27 warns about this pattern. It says this, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Don't be mistaken. <laughs> An enemy, someone who hates you, will go on and on about how wonderful you are so they can manipulate you or hurt you or use you in some way. 
That's how it works. In May of 2008, I was not at all happy to hear the words, Paul, you have cancer. I wasn't happy to hear those words. Didn't help me at the time. Wasn't, wasn't good news for me. But it would certainly not have helped me if the doctor said, oh, Paul, look at you. You're so strong and healthy. You can outsmart cancer. Besides, it's only in one lymph node. It'll probably just go away on its own. I wouldn't be standing here today if that doctor did that. A faithful friend is willing to wound you for your ultimate good. Proverbs chapter 28 states that principle like this. It says, Whoever rebukes a man will afterward find more favor than he who flatters with his tongue. So rebuke or correction certainly never feels good at the time, but it is essential because we have a tendency to not see ourselves rightly, don't we? We have a tendency to not see ourselves rightly. Marriage was that mirror for me. First year or two, oh, I realized, looking in that mirror, I wasn't nearly as kind and thoughtful and patient and helpful as I thought I was. Marriage is that mirror. We have a tendency to not see ourselves rightly. One time when I was a little guy, I, I heard my grandparents sitting at the table talking about my grandpa's cataract surgery. And I thought, ah, it doesn't sound fun, it sounds painful, I don't want to hear about it, whatever. But then I stopped what I was doing, whatever I was playing with, when I heard my grandma say, so here in the test tube is the cataract that they dug out. It's like, that sounds pretty cool. Let me see it, Grandma. So she's got this little test tube with this cloudy little white thing in it. And I looked at it, and I looked at my grandpa, and I looked at it, and I looked back at my grandpa. <laughs> he smiled, and his eyes opened wide, and he leaned in toward me. <laughs> I don't remember much else about that interaction, except that, that Grandpa said he could finally see clearly. So what happened there was Grandpa had trusted himself to a skilled surgeon so that he could see clearly. He could see himself clearly. He could see others clearly because he had that surgery. So I'll say, if you have the humility to receive correction from a person who loves you enough to correct you and you trust them enough to love you that well, that's going to help you a long way. It's going to get you a long way in, in cultivating a right view of yourself that you could be the kind of friend that you want to have. So here we go. Is there someone in your life who loves you enough to rebuke you? Let me just say that if, if you have a relationship with someone and it's gone on for a long time and they, they've never corrected you, they've never challenged you, but all they've done is pat you on the head and said the cancer will go away on its own or you're smart enough and strong enough and you'll be fine, I'm not sure they really love you. Surround yourself with wise people who love you because Jesus loved them first and they want to show you a reflection of God's love for you. Wise people cultivate deep friendships with people who live and love wisely. So we've seen three uh, themes in Proverbs related to surrounding ourselves with wise people first. If, if we want to cultivate deep friendships with people who live wisely, the first thing to do is surround yourselves by people who live wisely. Second, we want to listen to advice from people who live wisely. And then third, we want to listen to correction from people who live wisely. So practically speaking, what, what might it look like in your life and in mine? Renowned Dallas Seminary professor, Dr. Howard Hendricks, he probably wouldn't want me to use that word if he was around <laughs> But he, he's well known throughout the world. Howard Hendricks from Dallas Seminary, he's known for saying that every Christian needs to have a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy in their life. So we all need a mentor like the Apostle Paul to learn from as a Christian role model. We all need a peer like Barnabas that we can be an encouragement to, and he or she can be an encouragement to us. If you're a guy, it's going to be a guy. If you're a lady, it's going to be a lady. And we, we all need a Timothy. We all need to invest in a Timothy to help equip the next generation of faithful Jesus followers. So we would be that person's Paul, Apostle Paul. So, 
So the Apostle Paul, walking through these three relationships, the Apostle Paul was a preacher, he was a church planter, who wrote several of the uh, Holy Spirit-inspired New Testament letters to the first century churches, and also to Timothy and Titus, uh, and Philemon and so on. So, so, so Paul mentored the Philippian church in gospel truth, and he wrote to encourage them to stand firm in the Lord, stand firm in their faith. As chapter 4 begins, you can sense Paul's love for those he mentored. He wrote these words. He says, My brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. He's just gushing love for them. So stand firm thus, referring back to chapter 3 about showing how to put their faith and their hope in Christ alone. Stand firm like that, he says as he begins this next chapter. And there weren't chapter and verses at the time, but you get the idea, the, the flow of the letter, saying, be like that, do that. So the Apostle Paul lived humbly under God's ultimate authority with a powerful urgency for the sake of the gospel, as he invested in the Philippian church and he invested in others, teaching them to do the same. So are you cultivating a deep relationship with a mentor like the Apostle Paul in your life, who, who can lovingly urge you toward a gospel-empowered urgency for delivering each day. Well, I'm blessed with a few men who have mentored me uh, and continue to mentor me as I learn to follow Jesus as a husband and as a father and as a pastor. They're, they're instilling in me an urgency for the sake of the gospel. I'm blessed. So I encourage you to, to pray about getting connected this way with someone in the church here. Uh, the church, other church elders and I will be glad to pray with you and talk with you about how to get connected with somebody who can be an Apostle Paul in your life, a mentor to, to build into you. So what about a Barnabas? Well, some of Paul's church planning work was done with a man named Barnabas. The name Barnabas means son of encouragement. So this is what uh, Acts chapter 11 says about Barnabas. It says, Barnabas was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. Well, in Acts chapter 9, says that Barnabas is the guy. It, it all hinged on Barnabas. God used Barnabas so he could help Paul be in with the early disciples, who at first doubted the genuineness of Paul's faith. Remember, Paul was a persecutor. He's a violent man. He hated Christians. And then God rescued him. And then he had this live with gospel urgency. And then Barnabas goes, no, guys, I'm serious. He means it. It's genuine. I, I know Paul. He's genuine. Let's bring him into the church. Let's, let's partner with him. That was Barnabas. So then chap several chapters of Acts chronicle the adventures of Barnabas and Paul as partners in ministry through trials of various kinds. All sorts of trials. They walk side by side for years with great intentionality for the sake of the glory of God in his gospel. That's a Barnabas. So do you have a peer like Barnabas in your life? Someone to encourage you, whom you also can encourage with wisdom for life. Those of you who married, your spouse should be that person. Married to an unbeliever, find a same gender person uh, who's walking deeply with God. You're unmarried or you're, you're married to an unbeliever. So one of our small groups would be a great place for you to get connected with someone like Barnabas. Uh, I'm blessed certainly with several Barnabases in my life, most notably my sweetheart for 22 and a half years. You need a Barnabas. We all need a Barnabas. And we all need to be a Barnabas for someone else for the glory of God. What about a Timothy? What about finding a Timothy or a guy like Titus? Well, in his letter to the Corinthian church, the Apostle Paul referred to Timothy as, it says, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. My beloved and faithful child in the Lord. Is there someone who looks at you like that? Paul mentored the young pastor Timothy. He loved Timothy as his own son. Same with Titus. Titus is my man. You know, I, we're doing him in our small group. Titus is my man. Not surprisingly, Titus chapter 2 speaks of people mentoring one another. He just lays it out. Older women, young women, older men, young men, do this. It's Titus chapter 2. So to find a Timothy or a Titus is to find a person for whom you can be like the Apostle Paul. So want to find a Paul, find a Barnabas, find a Timothy or a Titus. I'll just say that I was friends with a guy named John Fay during, eighth, during uh, fifth grade. During art class one time, we made these little buttons that said, Paul and John, friends forever. 
to make it manly. I made little lightning bolts in there. So then a year later, John moved away, less than a year actually. John moved away, and we never talked again. I don't know where John is. I don't know where the button is. <laughs> this just in. Eventually, everyone will disappoint you or leave you. Eventually, everyone will disappoint you or leave you. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So even if you connect to deep relationship, a deep friendship with a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy, how are we to find this, this friend spoken of in chapter 18 who truly, always, reliably sticks closer than a brother? Can there even be such a thing? I, I've been disappointed by mentors, and I've certainly disappointed people that I'm mentoring. I've disappointed people I'm walking alongside. Please don't even ask Pam the times I disappointed her. She's been very gracious. Here's the deal with Proverbs. While nothing in Proverbs and nothing in the whole Old Testament is initially about Jesus, the book of Proverbs and all the Old Testament are ultimately about Jesus. They ultimately point toward him. The ultimate purpose of cultivating deep friendships with a Paul and a Barnabas and a Timothy is to cultivate a deep relationship with Jesus. Jesus spoke this wisdom to his first followers. He said, I'm the true vine. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So Jesus is the vine and we're the branches. So Jesus said this to picture this vital, life-giving relationship that incidentally bears the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Does that sound familiar? So Jesus calls all who follow him to, to cultivate a deep relationship primarily with him. So how could you cultivate a deep relationship with Jesus today here in Ripon in 2021? Gather for worship on Sunday morning, what you're doing right now. You can invest in cultivating relationships with Paul and Barnabas and Timothy or Titus. You can join a small group where God's word is central and cherished. You can invest time cultivating a relationship with God in prayer. Read Philippians 1, 9 to 11, as we read during the time of pastoral prayer this morning. Say, what does this say about God? What does this say about people? I'm going to pray about that right now. You invest time cultivating a relationship with God by reading his word. Memorize it. Meditate on it. Treasure it. God's word is life to us. Remember, the Bible isn't just some theological encyclopedia. It, it's breathed out by God. So, so that means that it's the word of God, empowered by the spirit of God, that really does the work of God in the people of God for the glory of God. So his word is central here in Trinity Church because his word does his work. Remember those words, let there be light? He spoke and his word worked. So the great news of the gospel is what sets the stage for you, you and I to cultivate this relationship with God. Even as we we're born into this world spiritually dead and alienated from God, he rescued us. See, you see the perfect life and the sacrificial death and the powerful resurrection of Jesus Christ counts in place of all who believe. And that is our claim to righteousness and wisdom before our holy God. I was disappointed this week by a few things. I'm disappointed right now by the furnace breaking down and that, that shade pulling off the wall when I tried to pull it down earlier. I'm disappointed by those things. But you know what the reality is? There, I have new life in Christ and that reality should overshadow every disappointment in this broken world. Because Jesus lived and died and rose again in my place that I might be able to cultivate a right relationship with God the Father now and forever by his grace. And let me just say it's the same for you. So you think of the cross, you think about Jesus, you think about Proverbs, you think about Jesus' perfect life, you think about his sacrificial death, you think about the cross, you think about the resurrection, think about this. Think three words. Think, I am loved. That's what it comes down to. You are loved. 
God will be glorified. God will be glorified in his creation. God will be glorified in your redemption. He will bring it home. This is how deeply you are loved by this great God who created you for his purpose and redeemed you for his glory by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, does that stir your heart to worship him?